studying the uh, JFK assassination? On the weekend of the assassination, I discussed this with my then brother-in-law, Harold Feldman, who wrote on this matter and uh, since has died. And we talked about Oswald, the alleged assassin. And we said that one had to maintain an open mind on the issue of whether or not he was the assassin and whether or not there was a conspiracy. But that that open mind would have to close if during the course of the weekend Oswald was killed. When Oswald was killed, both of us decided that this was a matter which could not be entrusted to the government, that the investigation of it would have to be undertaken by private individuals. And that perhaps uh, we would, on, s on this matter, have to do work ourselves. And what do you consider uh, your, your specialization or focus of the, of the research or the work that you've done over the years? Well, Dave. These may seem like obvious questions, but. Uh, I uh, initially investigated this matter in 1964 uh, in cooperation with Mark Lane. Harold and I went to Dallas. We. Uh, met with, and I remained with for four days, uh, Marguerite Oswald, and uh, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald. And we investigated uh, the uh, Tenth and Patton killing of Tippett. We uh, came across Aquila Clemens uh, through the intervention of Marguerite Oswald. Aquila Clemens was an, a, a uh, woman who lived across the street from the killing and saw two men on opposite sides of the street conversing with one another, calling to one another, and one of them going to the Tippett car and killing Officer Tippett. So uh, we then questioned Helen Markham and uh, her husband, I must say that before we got to her, that we saw a Dallas police car um, pulling away. When we spoke to those people, I've never seen that kind of terror. Uh, their teeth were actually chattering, and we could get little from them because of their terror. So we became, began, I began as really an investigator. Uh, and I collected uh, newspaper articles which seemed to point in the direction of Oswald being a U.S. intelligence operative, an agent provocateur. When we put these together, and Harold wrote an article for The Nation, which was called Oswald and the FBI, and uh, that's what we were doing initially. Then the Warren report came out, and I read it. I remember calling Harold after I read it and said, it seems clear to me that the report is totally convincing. It had to be an assassination at the very core of the American government, the highest level of power, because the report reveals quite clearly an assassination by conspiracy, and then comes out with a conclusion that one man did it and did it alone. This contradiction of the conclusion against the evidence is a manifestation of great arrogance and great power. Only the center of the American
power structure could have effectuated this and expected that the American press would play along with it. And whereupon I uh, went with my report, the Warren Commission report, to a meeting of the Philadelphia Bar Association immediately after the report came out. And the meeting was a design to pay an accolade to a staffer of the Warren Commission who was of tremendous significance in solving the ammunition shortage, which the Commission was confronted with having only three bullets with which to perform all the wounds and hits of uh, Dealey Plaza. And that was, of course, Arlen Specter. And he made a presentation to the Bar Association members who were assembled there, and then opened himself up to questioning. And I uh, directed some questions for, to him, and he was unable to answer them. So when the meeting was over, my colleagues at the bar, some of them gathered around and said, look, write an article on this. So I went home, and that night, while dealing with other clients, I wrote the first analysis of the shots, trajectories, and wounds of the Warren Commission, sent it to the then Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar, Theodore Vores, and said, uh, the Bar Association has paid honor to Mr. Spector. I think that there are problems in the analysis of the assassination as uh, set forth in the Warren Commission report. And uh, do you have the uh, courage to put a dissenting view in a law journal? And his answer was, that he put it, that article, which was the, a Philadelphia lawyer analyzes the shots, trajectories, and wounds of the Warren Commission in the oldest legal journal in the United States, Legal Intelligencer. And that analyzed the shots, trajectories, and wounds and concluded with the uh, idea that the Warren Commission report was totally convincing and everybody should believe what it provided in evidence. And what it provided in its evidence was conclusive evidence that there was a major conspiracy in the killing of the president. It was the first attack on the single bullet theory, the first analysis I know printed anywhere in the world. And I must say that I should get no credit for that, whatever. I did it while dealing with clients in between clients and answering phones and did it that night. I don't think it took three hours of work. It just rushed out at me from the Warren Commission report. It's almost as if the government wanted us to know that this was an act of great power and that the evidence be damned. It didn't matter that it was not the evidence that mattered, but the affairs of state that mattered. It was not the people that mattered, but it was the government and its legitimacy or illegitimacy that mattered. That's what the Warren Commission report cried out to me. And I'm a man of limited intelligence, limited ability, never fired a rifle in my life, and was able to see what they were telling us if we wanted to know, if we wanted to know. But once you know, and as you know, Dave, they become committed to the idea of doing something about this. And the job was for the American media to make this look 
so complex, so prolex, so difficult to comprehend, so subject to debate that the public would weary of trying to know, when in fact the public did believe, always did believe that there was a conspiracy. And the public was permitted to believe, but it was not permitted to know the obvious, that it had a gangster government led by the military-industrial complex under the control of the intelligence system, which would manipulate us internally and seek to provide hegemony over the whole world in terms of American military power. We would become more militarized, would become more aggressive, more imperial, and at home we would become just a facade of a democratic structure, manipulated by the covert black bag aspects of our governmental structure. Uh, can I shut this door here? I thought they that you like dogs. I you do. you turn very quickly. Yeah, I do, but I I'm, don't I'm, have one camera. If I if if I assess you correctly, it won't be long before you'll be defending the Warren report. Oh no, we don't want to do that. I'll bet you will be. You will be. No, do <laughs> okay, and I'm not looking for five second sound bites, but um, I know that it, it we could go on for an hour on each one of these questions, but we want to try to keep it a little, a little shorter if we can. And I feel uncomfortable saying that. No, no, please say it. Don't hesitate to, to say whatever you have to say. Okay. Now you answered second and third question in one shot. Now I assume that that uh, that your initial um, challenge to the single bullet theory would probably be what you would consider your most significant no, accomplishment no. in the case. No. Okay. Well, okay, I. I, I would say no. No. Okay. Uh, well, then, the next question is, what do you consider your most significant accomplishment? I think my most significant accomplishment, Dave, is understanding that what I did in terms of being the first one to attack the single bullet theory was not important. In understanding that, the government really probably wanted us to involve ourselves in the minutiae of the evidence, to take an endless microanalytic micro look at the evidence and to delve with, into that and to fetishize it and not to get out of it and to look above it and to take a macroanalytic look at the evidence and ascertain what it means, what it meant what the motivation was, why the assassination were, was, in fact, perpetuated, perpetrated, and how it was had, what's going to operate in the society, the people who did it, how they were going to exercise their power, and how they were going to change the direction of the society. So what I think the most significant thing I did was to pull myself out of this microanalysis and to try to explain why it happened, to give a model of explanation. That, I think, is the important thing that I did. I departed from the rest of the critics, took myself away from them, and said, look, let's try to make some sense out of this. Let's try to say what it, what it was behind the assassination and how the assassins are operating, if they are, to affect our society. That is, I think, I, I did that very early. And I think that's an, that was an important move. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of the critics now, the ones that, are, that I feel are the most responsible <coughs> critics, uh, make that point is that uh, let's not get lost in the maze of Dealey Plaza. Let's get beyond Dealey Plaza. And I, I, I agree with you. That's very significant. Um, why is this case still so important three decades later? I think it's most relevant to our society. I think that... What happened in Dealey Plaza was that a duly elected president was fired. 
But the constitutional process was relegated to a paper-thin facade that what was left at that time to American democracy was relegated to theatrics, to the theater of the absurd. Is there any hope at this? Excuse me. Oh, and that what is happening now is a continuation of what was set forth then. And that is that we became more a militarized society. Under the guise of a Cold War, we were told that the increase of governmental expenditures to the military s sector of the economy was necessary. So we began to spend in the order of $300 billion of national wealth per year on the military industrial complex, which caused us to neglect the private sector, neglect education, neglect health service delivery to the poor, neglect increasing poverty, neglect the homeless, neglect in short a, an effort to make the society fair and to make the uh, wealth of the country more equally and equitably distributed so that we'd have a state which we could be proud of, where the needs of our people would be met, where it would be social mobility, upward social mobility, which I enjoyed and the future of the society could enjoy. Instead, we became militarized. Instead, rather than being competitive economically and maintaining our competitive edge and being able to maintain the highest standard of living in the world, we have been slipping. And now we have slipped to 11th and 12th in our standard of living. The number of poor increases. The injustice of this unequal distribution of wealth it escalates. Education, public education is neglected. The poor are neglected. And we see that although the Cold War is dissipated, the military expenditures remain pretty much flat, hanging close to the $300 million, billion dollar a year point. And we find the president, who's I think a basically a decent man, nonetheless coming out for increased expenditures in the absence of a Cold War for intelligence. That's why it's so significant. The people who seize power, November 22, 1963 at Dealey Plaza, are still in power and are still distorting the quality of the American constitutional structure and are still destroying the quality of life in this society, destroying our cities, treating our cities like third world cities. Well, they don't bomb them like they bombed Hanoi or Baghdad. But nonetheless, they look very much like they've been bombed. Look at Philadelphia, which was a, whole, the, a city of neighborhoods, beautiful working class neighborhoods with good housing stock. Go to North Philadelphia. I think that Hanoi at its worst would not compare disfavorably to North Philadelphia today. Yeah. That's why it's so important. I've been to North Philadelphia. I went to school at Temple main campus and a couple blocks off here in the wasteland, so I see exactly what you mean. Is there any hope of conclusively solving this case at this late date? I think the case has been solved. This is a question of coming to the realization that it has been solved, that we know, we know, we don't, they don't, the government will have you believe anything. That's respect for a democracy. You can believe anything. But if you purport to know something, like this government is illegitimate because it is really controlled by the military industrial intelligence complex and you act accordingly, then the media will deal with you. Then you'll feel the weight of American governmental power. So if you know this and say you know it, you become a, an outlaw in terms of being able to communicate with people. But we have to get enough outlaws in that respect to say we know what happened. We know this government is illegitimate. We know we don't have a democracy and we want our democracy back again. When enough of us say that, 
then we will get change. But this, there is no mystery to this assassination. This matter is not debatable, except on arranged debates. In a fair debate, there is no way, no way to support the proposition that there was no conspiracy in the killing of Kennedy, and that conspiracy wasn't at the highest level of government, and that conspiracy doesn't, didn't affect our government then, and isn't affecting our government, our economy, and our lives in every material respect today. Now, uh, this is a difficult question for some people, and uh, you can pass on it if you like. Um, who do you feel are the researchers or critics who uh, may have contributed the most to our understanding of the case today? In other words, who do you feel are some of the more responsible critics who uh, have done good work over the years? I know you don't want to leave anyone out. But... Sure, I, I'd like to talk to that issue. I think that uh, Gaten Fonzi, who has just written The Last Investigation, is perhaps the most responsible of the critics, certainly the most responsible investigator. What he has done is historically significant. He has demonstrated that the assassination was orchestrated by David Attlee Phillips and uh, David Morales, both of whom were high placed CIA officials. Uh, not right-wing nuts. David Attlee Phillips was a, a, a gentleman in every respect. I'm sure respected by, loved by, and loving of Alan Dulles. In the center of power of the CIA, Gaten has demonstrated to anybody's complete satisfaction, anybody who reads that book thoroughly will say that he has done his homework, done it well, and proved that the assassination was orchestrated by the Central Intelligence Agency. That's such a historically important work. He did it himself. He did the work himself, therefore he knows it's correct, and anybody who knows Gaten and knows his passion for truth and his thoroughness and his, how careful he is knows that he's right. Now, why is that historically important? All other investigations which in any way deviate from that design of the Central Intelligence Agency having been at the center of the killing of Kennedy, any other investigation or investigative work, either consciously or unconsciously, is missing the mark. It can be used, therefore, as a standard against which, against which all other investigation can be compared. And if the other investigation does not comport with it, it can be rejected. So Gaten Fonzi was of enormous importance. Sylvia Marr was of enormous importance. Sylvia Marr, as you know, prepared an index on the uh, Warren Report and also on the House Committee. And uh, that work was significant and aided uh, researchers. She, of course, wrote Accessories After the Fact, which was uh, perhaps the best book written in terms of the work and the modus operandi of the Warren Commission, destroying it as a responsible body. Uh, Sylvia did monumental work. Uh, Garrison, for all his flaws, which are so much emphasized by the American press, was a great man. And his investigation, if you look at the trial notes, uh, the transcripts, you'll find 
contributed importantly to the truth. The Clinton aspects of the Clay Shaw trial, where Clay Shaw was seen with Oswald in Clinton, uh, Mississippi. Uh, and also at the ferry in the same At Florida. ferry. Mm -hmm. uh, the ferry aspects of the investigation. The, uh, uh, the Fink uh, testimony, which demonstrates that there was no autopsy. Fink pointed out how admirals and generals came in and took over that autopsy, said they were in charge, and forbade the autopsy specialists from tracking the hit in the back, which Siebert and O'Neill, the FBI agents who were observing it, said did not exit. Uh, that testimony given under oath is of historical significance. But think of what this man Garrison did. Garrison was a public official, enormously respected in New Orleans, I'm certain was on his way becoming a governor, a much beloved man with a great charisma. He was the only public official in the whole world who understood that the assassination was a very high level conspiracy of intelligence agents who had enormous power and he took them on. What courage. What a hero. What a man. How deserving of our admiration. How deserving of the happy role he will play and enjoy in history. Uh, they're the three people I most respect. Okay. Would there be any purpose served, or do you think that, uh, uh, obviously this is idealism, but uh, if, if the situation presents itself, should we have another investigation, and if so, uh, how should it be? Would a special prosecutor be the best way, or what do you feel about that? Well, uh, if you're asking me whether the government, the murderers of John F. Kennedy, should conduct uh, another investigation after having uh, given such monumental lies in its first two investigations. Heavens, no, no more governmental investigation. Should there be further investigation? Sure. We should zero in on the people who did it, identify them, see them for what they are, take them on no matter what their power. But that investigation should not be conducted by governmental circles. It should be conducted by private individuals around the world, because this affects not only this country, but around the world. Perhaps a million South Vietnamese died as a consequence of what happened in Dealey Plaza. That the world's hanging always between peace and war. And it's the interests of the people who killed Kennedy who maintain war to find enemies, to seek them desperately, to manufacture them, to have the American media play them up so that the weapons business can continue and that the greed can continue to be satisfied so that our job is to have international scholars from around the world join in the commission, very like, for example, the Dewey Commission, which met uh, with distinguished academicians, respected scholars, John Dewey, a very loved and respected philosopher and educator in the United States, heading up the commission, looking into the issue of the purge trials in the Soviet Union that began after the assassination of Kirov, December 1 of 1934, which resulted in eventually the elimination of maybe a million old Bolsheviks 
When the Dewey Commission determined correctly that all these confessions in all these trials were phony, that the Soviet government was framing these people. And they were cooperating in many respects in the framing out of their sense of duty to socialism, to the Soviet state. They went along to their death, sometimes admitting and confessing to their crimes, which were no crimes at all. So we found literally you know, a million, perhaps, old revolutionaries being killed with no evidence but manufactured evidence. And the Dewey Commission was able to determine this and announce it to the world. Such a commission, certainly having no connection with the United States government, because the United States government is the murderer. I would not turn over to the murderers the job of determining who the murderers were. That, I think, lacks common sense. But I would turn it over to independent thinkers around the world who are willing to address power. Okay. Now, um, there's, after the Stone film, there was an outcry for the release of the files. And uh, during the election campaign for president, uh, there was a question delivered to Clinton about uh, whether he believed in a conspiracy. And he deferred to his vice presidential partner, Gore, who stated that he did believe there was one. And um, that leads to the, to the question is, should the president become involved? I know he has to appoint members to the review board to force the files out, which are still being withheld. Do you think the president should become more in, actively involved in resolving the controversy for the American people? And can he do that? I think, uh, ideally, he should announce that uh, we had a coup in November 22, 1963. But practically, he cannot do that. I don't think we have had a president with any degree of power, of any consequence, since the killing of Kennedy. That the Dealey Plaza firing of Kennedy was, and continues, and will continue to be, a message to every president you're just the president so much and no more. We, the killers, own the presidency. The Dilly Praza killing of Kennedy did not only kill a president, it effectively killed the presidency. Every president who has had to follow Kennedy, even one I can think of with very few brain cells, had to know what happened. Had to know, therefore, what could happen to him if he did not recognize where the power over the presidency really lay. So I suggest to you that, yes, ideally, the president should openly advise the American public and the world that we had a coup, but that as a practicable matter, that is not going to happen. And therefore, it's up to the American people to use this politically, not to divide up the society. And I suggest to you that the people who killed Kennedy have effectively managed to divide up the family, which against uh, the, the uh, country uh, in a very effective way, rich against poor, class against class, race against race, ethnic group against ethnic group, shattering old coalitions, that people must come together in the knowledge that a more open society will benefit all of us will improve the quality of life for all of us, will improve the relations in the world for all the peoples of the world. 
and therefore all of us have a great stake in knowing the truth of that coup and reversing it and organizing politically. One man, one president won't be able to do it, Dave. Each of us who come to know the truth must join together, organize politically, and struggle, maybe a long struggle, to defeat the power those rulers who took over the presidency in Dealey Plaza. No single president can do it for us. We have to do it. Um. Yes, Betsy. Pause for a second. Michael, David. Hi, Betsy. The bastard bullet. And I'll give you, excuse me, let me give you something right now. His latest book is really an essay, but I hope I have a copy. Yeah, it's yours. Uh, and that destroys the single bullet theory, completely destroys it. I noticed you have some of the research journals. I, I managed to get all of the third decade and all of Paul Hook's research journals. I read Paul Hook's research journals like a book. The, the thing, the let me just say this, uh, not for filming. Do you have a film on it? It's not on yet, is it? Yeah, it's on, but I'll turn it on. Say something about Ray Marcus, may I? Okay, sure. May I just say something about one other critic who I think is very significant, who is self-published and therefore not well known, but of tremendous importance, and that is Raymond Marcus. Raymond Marcus uh, wrote the Bastard Bullet, which was a book that demonstrated beyond a purview of a doubt that CE Commission Exhibit 399, the magic bullet, was a plant and could not have been anything else other than a government plant. And he did it with such beautiful exercise of logic, such an application, a vigorous application of common sense that you must consider him a scientist in this field. After all, that's essentially what science is, the rigorous application of common sense. And Ray Marcus has so much common sense. And the logic which he employs in the magic bullet is so marvelously applied to this case that he, I think he completely demolished the Warren Report. He recently produced the House Select Committee assassination, the Zapruder film, and the single bullet theory. And this demonstrates beyond a question that Kennedy and Connolly were definitely hit by separate bullets, and therefore the Warren Report had to be wrong, and the House Committee, Select Committee report, which defended the single bullet theory, was a farce and so self-evident, again, no mystery. When you really apply careful thinking to the evidence, there's nothing left of this assassination which constitutes a mystery. It's so clear. And Marcus makes clear that the shot evidence of the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee report are clearly wrong. He does it brilliantly, and he deserves enormous credit. Now, uh, I assume <clears throat> it seems obvious that uh, there were multiple shooters, and you believe that. Now, do you think that Oswald was an agent of U.S. intelligence, and if so, uh, was he even one of the shooters? Do you believe whether he was a shooter or not? Dave, had to be an object, a servant, an agent of U.S. intelligence. Uh, he was the perfect patsy, carefully selected by U.S. intelligence. Think of him. He was a U.S. Marine who, during the course of his Marine training, studied Russian. Now look, the U.S. Marines, like any military force anywhere in the world is not a democratic institution. And if he were studying Russian, he was, if he was studying Russian, then it was with the sanction of the U.S. military. 
He became a defector. His mother always felt, told me, told the commission that she never felt he was a defector. He went, she went to Washington, she tells me, and was treated with uh, kid gloves, had an appointment in the State Department immediately. They was, she was reassured not to worry about his defection when he had defected. Uh, so that there he was sent over by U.S. intelligence to the Soviet Union and in a, their program of, of trying to get fake defectors in the Soviet Union. He re was returned to the United States having married a uh, Marina who was a niece of a KGB colonel and the Soviets let him out. Uh, which uh, leads me to think that maybe he was doubled by the Soviets as a double agent. He returned and uh, wrote to the American Communist Party. So he was uh, interested in the Communist Party. He got a three-page response from Arnold Johnson of the Communist Party which leads me to be uh, suspicious of that. At any rate, they treated him with a great deal of respect. Uh, he uh, formed the uh, Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans, and it was quite clearly the product of U.S. intelligence because he was the only member of that committee, a matter of uh, some suspicion. He uh, was befriended by Michael Payne, who had secret clearance uh, working in Bell Helicopter, although his, uh, his uh, father, George Lydon Payne, was a, uh, had been a Trotskyist. And for that kind of clearance, when you're associated with a family with left-wing connections of that sort, some quid pro quo has to be given. So Michael Payne very likely was doing favors for U.S. intelligence in order to be able to have a secret clearance. He was associated with Oswald, and he told me, Michael Payne told me in an interview, that he would go with Oswald to right-wing meetings in the Dallas area, and that Oswald would take very careful notes afterwards and he was apparently reporting on the right wing in Dallas. Uh, Michael Payne tells me he went with him to the ACLU meeting and uh, that uh, Oswald joined the ACLU. So what you see is Oswald being dipped into every aspect of the American political spectrum as my friend Jim Garrison was fond of saying what he saw in New Orleans was the Cubanization process of Oswald. There he was being given pro-Castro uh, airs. Uh, then, of course, whether or not it was he, someone posing as Oswald, uh, put a, uh, made a scene in Mexico City in the uh, Russian embassy and then the Cuban embassy. So what you're seeing is, uh, incidentally, he uh, was operating uh, in New Orleans uh, out of the same building which uh, was uh, being utilized by anti-Castro uh, people. So he was identified with pro-Castro people, anti-Castro people, pro-Soviet people, U.S. Marine Corps. He was uh, reportedly having shot at uh, Edwin Walker, attacking the right, and uh, apparently also perhaps a picketing uh, against Stevenson with the uh, right wing in Dallas. He was all things, all political aspects of the American political spectrum. A typical pattern for an intelligence agency to follow what they're doing is 
making it impossible for any aspects of the American political scene to undertake an investigation and attack on the official version for fear that they would be therefore vulnerable because Oswald had been associated with them, associated with the liberals, associated with the right wing, associated with the Trotskyists, associated with the Soviet uh, uh, Union, associated with uh, uh, Castro. A perfect, a perfect Patsy. Sure, he was associated with the American intelligence. Did he do any firing, Dave? No, he didn't do no, he did no firing. With that rifle, uh, which fired due to its sight, high to the right, with that trigger mechanism, which was defective, with his lack of skill as a marksman, he could have fired away all afternoon, right through the afternoon, in the night, and had done no damage. But was he doing any firing? No. The paraffin test indicated he hadn't fired a rifle. Uh, no, he did not do any firing. But will the American government try desperately to implicate him in a firing? Sure. Because so long as they have that thread hanging on him and all his threads leading into every aspect of the American political and even the Soviet and and Castro scene, then they have an opportunity to threaten those people who would want to deliver the truth. We could counter by making this, well, you're pro-Castro? You can counter, Dave, by making it a pro-Castro plot. Or, oh, you're a rightist? Or, oh, you're a pro-Soviet? Or, oh, you're ACLU? You liberals want to come in on it? Well, you see, it's so convenient. He was dipped into so many paints of so many varieties of the American political scene that everybody is vulnerable. But no, he did no shooting. So in a way, you have a mechanism set up ahead of time in a, in a, in a genius kind of manner to blackmail the Warren Commissioners so that they, even if they stumbled on the truth, they couldn't dare to reveal it because it would uncover all sorts of dirty tricks politics like, say, the Castro assassination plot. And obviously, it's very strange to see uh, Oswald associating with George de Mornschild and David Ferry and all these people. The question in my mind, and, and I see you have Dick Russell's book, which, which I've read, which is very interesting, that there is such a wilderness of mirrors, the doubling and the tripling of agents, that maybe Oswald didn't even know who he was working for. Maybe Oswald uh, wasn't even sure what his loyalties were or he was playing a game. I think that Oswald, for example, was working for the CIA and the FBI. When we get Wagner Carr, the Attorney General of Texas, coming out and suggesting that Oswald had an FBI number and telling us he was getting $200 a month, it's, he could only get that from one source, and that's Oswald during the interrogation. And I, I would guess that if you're working for the CIA, they instructed him, if you're picked up and you have to uh, reveal your identification, with intelligence, your FBI. I, I do know an interesting story about that. Uh, that may, may have been one of the, the deceptions that has gone on, but I, I do think it's more likely he has uh, CIA or military intelligence connections. But that FBI and former story, the, the actual origination of that was from uh, uh, Wagner Carr was, was uh, informed by that of um, Alonzo Hutkins. And Hutkins and um, another, a couple, another journalist, and uh, there was another person suspected that they would. This is an interesting story. Uh, suspected they were being tapped by J. Edgar Hoover, and one day, in order to test this theory, they decided to um, to say on the phone. They, they, there was a number there, and they decided to talk with each other and say. Well, Oswald was, we hear that he was an informant for the FBI and his number was so-and-so. And sure enough, a half hour later, an FBI agent turned up and started to question them about it. And what I, what I think is that is one of the, uh, and I don't mean to demean your, your presenting that story, uh, and I'll, I'll cut this out, is that's one of the things with this case is that uh, some of these stories, uh, I don't mean to seem like I'm debunking theory, because I'm not, 
but it just proves my point in that there's such a wilderness, a blizzard of information, misinformation, and disinformation that even even very good critics sometimes will take what has been uh, an honest mistake. Sure. Take it and sure. But there's no honest mistake of his having had Hosty number in his phone book. No, no doubt about that. Right. And that shows a connection with the FBI. Right. And, and there's no, I think, innocent mistake in concluding that he had tried to advise the FBI prior to the assassination and that the communication with his communication with the FBI was destroyed by the FBI. So I I think that he had connections with American intelligence mm -hmm. and I well, I conclude that those connections were FBI and CIA. I think it's definite, and you can establish with government documents, that J. Edgar Hoover had numerous threats on the president that he ignored and that he allowed him to be killed. And that when they wanted to investigate it, uh, the FBI, for nothing else but to avoid its, avoid its own embarrassment, in, in, uh, engaged in tremendous cover-up activities. Uh, I think J. Edgar Hoover was sitting in the catbird seat just waiting for the shots to happen. That's, that's my particular view. But, but Dave, but, uh, he was getting instructions too. Right. The Katzenbach memoranda mm -hmm. started flowing to Moyers and to uh, Hoover. They flowed. Lone Assassin. The Lone, Lone Assassin, Assassin leak it. Mm -hmm. They went to uh, Moyers, Bill Moyers, on this, uh, December 25th, right after right after Ruby dispatches Oswald higher than, uh, than uh, Hoover in the American government is instructing right. that Oswald did it, Oswald did it alone, give it out to the press, dispel all other uh, speculation. And on December 9th, think of this, on December 9th, Hoover wouldn't have had this kind of guts. The respected Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, just getting ready to undertake the job of investigating who killed Kennedy is treated like the lowliest of shysters, well, no lowly, shyster would take that kind of treatment, is sent this same kind of memorandum by the then deputy really operating as the attorney, uh, uh, as the attorney general of the United States, telling him that he should leak to the press that Oswald did it. There was no conspiracy and end speculation. That's treating the constitutional structure as if it didn't exist. There's supposed to be separation of powers. This man is supposed to be undertaking an investigation and he's told what he must believe. That does not pass as investigation and that doesn't seem to indicate that Hoover was the center of power, was much above Hoover. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Alan Dulles obviously was one of the Warren commissioners, and uh, one of the things that Earl Warren came very angry about was him withholding the Castro plots, which would have been an obvious area of investigation. And uh, Drew Pearson and Jack Anderson, I think, broke the story in 67, and LBJ sent the inspector general to go and investigate this, these allegations. And they did it, and they threw away all their research material and had this report, which I don't think has ever been uh, been released. But do you think Alan Dulles uh, was actively involved in the plot, or maybe later found out and knew that uh, he had to do whatever he could to uh, to cover it up? Because obviously he was the most vocal backer of the single assassin, and he would bring this literature to the commissioners and say, here, look, American assassinations are almost always crazed lone assassins. Do you think he was... Um, actively covering up during the Warren Commission and knew who killed Kennedy, if not, was part of the apparatus that was behind it. Well, Alan Dulles, uh, I saw from reading the uh, transcript of an executive session of the Warren Commission, was involved in a clear crime in covering it up. Uh, when Harold Feldman wrote that article, Oswald of the FBI. That prompted a secret executive session of the Warren Commission. And uh, during the course of this execu uh, executive session, someone makes mention that Marina Oswald 
was going to testify before the commission that Oswald was a double agent, served the Soviet intelligence and U.S. intelligence. And Alan Dulles said, uh, and that's not going to happen. Isaac Don Levine, who was an old czarist, right winger, came to the United States, had U.S. intelligence connections. He said, Isaac Don Levine, I, I have known him, has been assigned by Life magazine to write an article about Marina. Incidentally, he never wrote such an article. He was assigned, I'm sure, by American intelligence, not Life magazine, to Marina Oswald to keep her quiet. I have known him. I will talk to him. She will not so testify. That's suborning to perjury. That's a crime. So Alan Dulles is clearly, was clearly a criminal. Uh, now, he said uh, very early, the early critics started to attack the Warren Commission. If the critics do not believe the Warren Commission, do not believe that Oswald killed the president alone, let them name names. Heavy burden. But I think thanks to the work of Gate and Fonzie, we can name names now. You can be sure that David Atlee Phillips, that fine gentleman, was very cozy with Alan Dulles. You can be absolutely sure that Dulles was not completely fired by JFK over the betrayal that the CIA under Alan Dulles did of Kennedy when they sucked him in to this enterprise, contending to him that if it was not successful, that they would the people who hit the beaches would be able to retreat in the mountains and operate as guerrillas when there was no possible way of doing that. When the real plan was to have the U.S. ships loaded with Marines to follow up airstrikes by U.S. and invade when the Bay of Pigs effort failed. That was the real plan. He recognized that, JFK recognized that, and fired Dulles. He thought he fired him. Dulles continued to have the contacts in the CIA. And here we have a man who was fired by Kennedy, had headed up the CIA. Around the world, the leading candidate for the killing of Kennedy always was the CIA, none other. And he became the center of the core of the Warren Commission. And we caught him committing a crime supporting the per perjury. That man has to be a high suspect. Now, uh, in, and may I say, in covering it up, not a suspect, proven. Right. In terms of having killed Kennedy, I firmly believe he was a center of it. Okay. Now, uh, some recent evidence, which is interesting and uh, relates to the Mexico City uh, incident, and, and I, one of the things I think is key, is um, J. Lee Rankin uh, apparently uh, heard Mexico City tapes of the person who was supposed to be Oswald, whether it was a bug or a tap, and uh, was later heard by the FBI and determined not to be Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, the existence of this tape uh, was was uh, apparently hidden from the House Select Committee. Uh, J. Lee Rankin lied about it. And later, uh, they found out that they did have the tape, that they listened to it during the Warren Commission and buried it. Um, now, this leads to uh, the impersonation of Oswald and the false Oswald sightings, not only in Mexico City, but the Warren Commission supposedly determined Oswald was either in Mexico City or at work or at home during numerous times when there was an Oswald character out uh, at shooting ranges, on private property shooting, driving a car when he didn't know how to drive a car. And is this 
um, is this proof of U.S. intelligence uh, setting up Oswald as a patsy months in advance of the assassination? David, your question is uh, so beautifully formulated that it answers itself. Of course it is. The Mafia couldn't have done that. Castro couldn't have done that. The Soviets couldn't have done that. Which agency could have done that? American intelligence. The only possible one of the Ameri or more of the American intelligence agencies did that. And it's proof that since that was the Patsy, and they had designated him at that time, that the design for the killing of Kennedy was in the possession of the American intelligence agencies, that they had to have formulated the design, that they are the killers. Absolutely. It proves it. Now, the first uh, investigation after the Warren Commission was the Rockefeller Commission, which touched on the JFK assassination, and uh, they uh, supposedly debunked Hunt and Sturgis as tramps, which I think was a red herring anyway, and apparently wasted time. Uh, another thing they did was uh, look at the medical and ballistic evidence in the Zabruder film, and in, in, in my eyes, uh, led by, uh, by Bellin, uh, basically continued the Warren Commission cover-up. Now, when the, war when the Rockefeller Commission uh, was looked at by reasonable people, they could see that many of those people, including uh, Ronald Reagan and others, had uh, connections with intelligence. And uh, it looks like a pattern of the commission was, it was like the Warren Commission was set up again. And what happened is uh, people didn't believe that that was a legitimate investigation either, which led to the church committee. And... Um, your friend Gaten Fonzi was on the church committee, uh, and and I I think that the church committee was one of the one of the m the more honest, if you can even say that, of the investigations, in that it found extensive uh, misbehavior, uh, withholding by the intelligence agencies of information, uh, negligence, and and obviously uh, lying about it. Um, when and I want to try to lead this into a question. Um, do you think that um, the, uh, the Senator Church, who, who set up the, uh, the subcommittee of the Schweiker Hart, uh, which was Book 5, the, the report that they put out, uh, do you think that uh, Church would have... Um, would have done this on his own if he hadn't gotten so much pressure uh, about the American people not believing it. And uh, it's hard for me to tie this into a, to a, to a relevant question. Um, How do you explain the church committee? Yeah, what, what, is, what is your view on the church committee, yeah. I guess, would be a good question. I thought church was a good man, but that no senator is going to be permitted to designate the American government as a product of a coup and therefore illegitimate. That what happens when a man of this sort is put at the head of the committee is that the killers use such investigations and use it in this fashion. The truth is tussled with, wrestled with. Some wrong is admitted. The intelligence community lied to the American Congress, what's new? How significant is that? But uh, here you have disclosures, albeit nothing like the center of the truth. The whole governmental structure is rotten and run by the intelligence community. But you have some representations of failings, wrongdoings, by this apparatus. And this gives some comfort to the American people that their government is operating, that it's democratic, that wrongdoing can be aired, and therefore, ergo, we have proven that we have a democracy. So it's limited release of lesser evils to cover up 
the giant evil of this being a gangster apparatus. That's what happens. That's how liberals are used. I think the Warren Commission was used somewhat like that. I'm sure they were told that, look, it's a big thing. It's very high. We can't punish these people. They can take over the whole governmental structure. We can lose our democratic government. We can have an open military coup. You liberal guys can save the structure. You can save the Constitution. You can save democracy. Sometimes it doesn't pay to let the people know the whole truth. Would Richard A. Sprague have solved the case if he was left alone? No one man can solve a case. This is a matter for little people, many little people, to join together and become a powerful group that seeks the truth and demands the truth and knows the truth and states the truth and will not tolerate that our cities be denied what they need, that our poor be denied what they need in favor of providing junk weapons which can't be used against enemies which don't exist and have to be manufactured. Only when you get political movement of that kind can you get change. No single president can do it. No single investigator can do it. No special investigator can do it. Nothing from within the government can do it. History has demonstrated that pressure has to be put upon the government in order for progressive changes to occur. That Lincoln was not eager to free the slaves, but as the slaves began to pour out of the South into the Union armies, he had to free them. Kennedy was very reluctant to support civil rights. But as the people marched together, white and black, poor middle class, to get civil rights for blacks, Kennedy was pushed along. That's how history moves. Not by heroes within the governmental structures speaking out and cleaning things up, but pressure being brought from outside the government, on the government. That's what has to happen that the, we must consider the people more important than the government, the individual more important than the state. When we all feel that, we all come together, respecting one another, loving one another as individuals, we will get a better state. Not until then. Okay, uh, and I know you probably touched on some of this. Uh, this is my final question. I know we're running out of time. The, um, my killer question at the end, my interviews is usually to turn things around. If you were interviewing yourself, uh, what is the heart of the matter of this case? And in, in not necessarily in a nutshell, but as, as concise as it can be uh, tied together, what is, what is the most important thing about this case? I think the most important evidence, which tells you everything you have to know about who did it, and how high up it was, is what is reported in the Theodore H. White book of 1964, Making the President 1964, which he says, on the plane back, the presidential party, from Love to Andrews Air Force Base, There was a report from the Situation One Room of the White House that Oswald was apprehended. Oswald killed the president. There was no conspiracy. That was before there was any evidence against Oswald. That was while everybody in the motorcade was aware of bullets whizzing in from different directions. That is while the special agents of the Secret Service protecting the president were preparing to prepare their affidavits or had prepared their affidavits to the effect that shots came from the grassy knoll, shots came from different directions. These were trained men who knew 
how to ascertain the sources of shots. And it ascertained that they came from different directions, and therefore there was an ambush, there was triangulation of fire. This was a systematic paramilitary killing of a president. While all this evidence was known, while they saw him, they saw the president being thrown leftward and backward into the presidential limousine when he was supposed to have been shot from the rear and therefore required, according to Newton's second law of motion, to be driven forward rather than leftward and backward. And all of this could have been wrong, where Yarborough in the, Senator Yarborough in the motorcade said he smelled gunpowder in Dealey Plaza. All this could have been wrong, but at that evidence, Dealey Plaza reeked at that moment, at the killing of the president, that, that Dealey Plaza reeked of conspiracy, all of which may have been wrong. People heard more than three shots. Most of the witnesses thought the shots came from the grassy knoll. Zapruder thought the shots were coming from over his shoulder. All wrong, say. But that's what we had at that time. We had conspiracy. And the presidential party was being told that there was no conspiracy. And Oswald didn't want to know there was no evidence against Oswald. He'd been picked up for the killing of Tippett in Irving, Texas. Not for the killing of the president. Wasn't charged with that until much, much later. The gun traced to him much, much later. I wrote to White, and uh, White told me that this came from the Situation Room. The heart of American intelligence first married the single assassin concept. It would have come from McGeorge Bundy, who was in charge. He was in charge. He was in charge. Too smart to be fooled, that man. Now, I wrote to Salinger, who also reported this, that the same, the same communications were given to the cabinet plane over the Pacific flying to Japan. And I asked him for the tape, and he, I can show you all this correspondence. He agreed he would give it to me. He said he had given it to the Kennedy Library, it was in the uh, National Archives, and uh, then head of the National Archives, Robert Boehmer, said he would get it for me, and then Boehmer said that it's gone. Gone! And then right to the Pentagon, I wrote to the Pentagon, and Colonel Cross said, you can't get this, we only give it to people for governmental purposes, and Salinger and White had used it for non-governmental purposes. And it's still, me, still coming out in the books. Never ends. Let us begin anew. Gerald uh, S. and Deborah H. Strober, Haran, I'm sorry, Robert Manning, an undersecretary, on the uh, cabinet plane. The news then came in that someone named Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, presumed assassin of Kennedy, who had been in the Soviet Union, had done this. The news caused great alarm. Brand new book. And that is, in effect, a smoking gun, because they could not have known the evidence, because it had not been assembled yet. I, the, all they could have known is that Dealey Plaza cried out, conspiracy! That, I think, tells you how high it was. They were prepared to neutralize that from before the assassination. They were telling the people on the presidential plane, they were telling the people on the cabinet plane, look, people in the motorcade, you were there. You know what the evidence is. Forget evidence. We are committed to Oswald and only Oswald. Forget what you saw. Forget what you heard. Forget what you smelled, that gunpowder. Forget what your senses tell you. When you get off this plane, you know only one thing that Lee Harvey Oswald killed your president. No one else was involved. No one else was involved. It was no conspiracy. Understand that? You also understand what you saw and heard, but forget that. 
you're to hold both of those things as true. Oswald did it, and your senses tell you that it was a conspiracy. And now you are gripped in a paralyzed double-think process. George Orwell tells you what you are now. You're nothing. You are our subjects. We are the power. You we are, are the killers. You are what we tell you you are. We are what you tell you, or we tell you you are, and your hands are tied, and we've got you where we can hurt you. Another case in point is McDonald and Powers in the follow-up car. Uh, initially, we're going to report there were shots from the grassy knoll, but they decided, well, we better go along with what they're telling us, and they changed their story, and they later revealed the true story. So, in effect, the people that knew the truth knew they couldn't tell the truth uh, and knew they had to go along with it because they realized the scope and the power that was arrayed against them and that uh, preserving order, preserving the government... Preserving democracy. Preserving democracy by destroying democracy was more important of than course, the truth. Of course, like preserving me lie by destroying me lie and its people. This is the reasoning of the military-industrial complex. This is the reasoning of these people of gigantic power, enormous power, enormous arrogance, and murderous in their instincts. More important to dominate the world than to, to feed the masses in their own country. That's kind of a perverse sort of a priority, but that looks like the way things are. That's the way things are, and will be until the people use their knowledge we all know, I submit, at some level, what happened in Dilly Plaza. We all know what was behind it. We all know that they are still in power when we are willing to act like people who know should act as responsible citizens, rising up and not tolerating this abuse of power, this manipulation of people. Then the world will change for the better. And democracy not until will be restored at that point. Okay. Thank I know, you, I know we're out of time now. I appreciate this very no, much. We appreciate it. Thank you.